You didn't name somebody something just because it sounded cute, or I like the way it sounded, or you know how everybody wants it. I want a name that's different. I want a name that's unique. So I'm going to name my child Apple or Denim. You know how these names are because it's about being different. But in the ancient world, the naming of an entity went towards their essence. Or a parent might put their hopes or dreams in the name of their child. But it was very serious business. And you know this in our own story, right? Because um, um, people of color used to have as their first name, Colonel, Queen, King. Those are, these are names where we were putting the dignity in our children's names that they may not receive on the outside. So naming mattered, all right? So in the Bible, names speak to characteristics, and this was particularly true for deity. So if I were to ask you the name of your deity and you told me the name of your deity, I knew what I needed to know about who your God was because the name told us their function, their purpose for being. So that Baal is a God that we hear a lot about in the Old Testament. Um, he is one of the enemies of the God of Israel. Does anyone know what Baal means? Baal means husband. Right? I was like, what? Say what? Um, so the way this story works is that, what? Oh, I don't know what that was. I'm going to leave it alone. So the way this story works is that Baal was the male storm god, and he would, in the spring, ride the clouds. Baal had a chariot, rode the clouds, made it rain, caused it to rain upon the earth. The earth was fertilized. So husband, male deity, fertilized the female deity, all right? And then the female deity, the earth, brought forth the grain. So that Baal's function, his reason for being, was to make it rain. So think about, <laughs> that didn't come out right, but you know what I mean, right? So think about, now go back to the story of Elijah um, with the contest with the prophets of Baal, what were they supposed to do? The thing, that should have been an easy thing for Baal to do. Because that was his thing. Remember when Elijah's like, whoever I'm going to, um, um, no, no, that's not right. We're supposed to make fire come down. We're supposed to make fire come down. And, ba and Elijah covered his with water. So that's, but that's what Baal was supposed to do. Shemesh, sun god. Make the, you're the light. That's what you do. All right? Another Philistine deity we have, Dagon. Dagon means fish. Fish were a symbol of fertility. And so Dagon was another fertility god. So now go back to the story of the Exodus when God meets Moses on the mountain and he says, what's your name? When I go to the people and say, the God of your ancestors has sent me to tell you to do this, they're going to say, what's his name? What's his thing? What's his essence? What does he do? All right? And God, as is God's way, answers us, but not in the way we want to be answered. So God gives God's personal name. All right? So remember all these other names, Baal. Shemesh, the name speaks to what the deity does, all right? It's a title. It's a job description. But the personal name that God reveals to Moses is not a job description. It's what God is, all right? Stay with me because Moses says, God, what's, my, what's your name? God says, Ehyeh Asher Ehyeh, all right? which we translate, I am that I am, all right? So I'm going to, we're just going to stay here for 10 more seconds, and then we're going to move on, because remember, we're doing Jesus tonight, okay? What I want you to know about the Hebrew language is that it doesn't have what we call tense so much as it has aspect. In other words, in Hebrew, there are two kinds of action. There's action that's completed, and there's action that's not complete. All right? Something that's completed and done is something that we would translate as past tense because it's done. 
Everything else that's a verb in Hebrew is incomplete, which means it's either happening now or it's about to happen, okay? But whatever is imperfect isn't done yet. God's name is incomplete. It's imperfect. So it could be current, I am that I am, or it could be future, I will be what I will be. That whatever God is, is present and ahead of us, all right? Which means this is good, right? It's good when God's working on, our, in our, on our, the way we want God to work, <laughs> okay? So we've got this incomplete action. So it could be I am that I am, or I will be what I will be. I am what I will be, or I will be what I am. God reserves the right to reveal God's self in whatever way God chooses. That's God's personal name. Now, you have looked at that name because I know Pastor Wesley worked this very carefully out with you all. And um, then the other words you had were, so if if God's personal name, we use these four consonants to describe that name. Um, We could say Yahweh, or this is the word from which we get the hybrid word, Jehovah. The other words that you worked on would be something like El Roy, right? El is a name for God, right? And then this part would be the thing that God does. So that when Hagar meets God in the desert, she calls him El Roy or El Roy, God who sees. That's a title, all right? And y'all know in church we love the titles of God, right? Jehovah Jehovah Nisi, we like to list them out. God who does this, God who does that, God who does that. Some of them are El, some of them are Yahweh, right? So we have in the story of Abraham, when God tells him to take Isaac up on the mountain, we have Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yireh. God will, what is it? Y'all know, right? So we have the Lord is my healer, the Lord is my banner, the Lord is all of these things. All of these names then that we have with those descriptive titles are things that we would call titles for God. All right? Those are the categories that we would use. Now, when we move to the New Testament... We're looking for names of God, and God is made manifest to us in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. So we're looking for names for Jesus. We doing good? All right. Jesus is the Son of God. Not if you agree. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. We talk about Jesus as the second part of the Trinity, and we use that language to describe Jesus in the Trinity as the Son of God. I'm going to say a few more things. Jesus is God made flesh. If you want to get fancy, this is where you say Jesus is God incarnate. Um, That Jesus is fully God and fully human. And we say this so much and so often that we have this sense of familiarity about it, even though... The fact of the matter is, it's hard to get your head around how you can be fully God and fully human at the same time. And most of us, when we are reading about Jesus, we usually err on one side or the other. Sometimes we read Jesus as more human. Sometimes we read Jesus as more divine. But if it, it, was, it is still hard for us to understand it. And what I want you to realize tonight, it was hard for the people who spent time with Jesus. Yeah. All right? Because he, he looked like them, right? He ate like them. And then he did these crazy things that nobody else could do. But they had never seen anything like this before. So how do you make sense out of something that you have never seen before? How do you make sense out of something you've never seen before? What'd you say? What? Oh, now we get quiet. (laughs) 
faith. Faith is um, something we do, but that's not how we make sense of it. Yes, right. If you don't understand something, you try to compare it. So this is how we explain things to children all the time. What's a so-and-so? Well, you don't start with something they don't know. You start with something they do know. Well, do you know how such and such works? Well, then you take that and try to apply it to the unknown, all right? Hold on to that, because I want us to think then about that when we look in the Gospel of John, all right? But the names that we find for Jesus in the New Testament are going to tell us about how God makes God's self known to us. So we're going to look tonight at names for Jesus in the fourth gospel, which is the gospel of John. So again, here's that moment where you sit back because you already know this, but just bear with me. There are how many gospels? What are they? Okay, good. Now, here's the trick question. Which one do we think was the first gospel written? Yes, Mark. All right, very good. Um, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three are what we call the synoptic gospels. And synoptic literally means see together. Optic, I, sin, synchronous with, see together. That the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, share common source material, have the same stories, um, even though each one is distinct, they have a lot of similarities, all right? And then we come to John. And John is not like any of the other Gospels. Um, and you can tell that as soon as you start reading it, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what in the world is he talking about? In the beginning was the Word. Okay, could somebody just tell me? Briefly, what that means. What does that mean? Hmm? In the beginning, there was communicator. Okay, what does that mean? God communicated with us. Okay? Through, through. Okay. So... If you want to get with John, you have to spend some time thinking about how the, what the word, word means, or the possibilities of meanings within the word, word, yes? Um, and so what I want you to think about is that John is highly symbolic, all right? And again, here's the problem when you grow up in church. You know it so well you think you know what it means. Like, because you say it all the time. Here you can recite all these verses, but reciting them doesn't always mean we understand it or that we understand all that's in it. So in John, we have this highly symbolic language, and we're going to have a test about this symbolic language at the end. So get ready. And the way the test works is I'm going to set it up for Pastor Wesley, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, so... Um, highly symbolic language. John doesn't talk about Jesus doing miracles. He talks about Jesus doing signs. And John doesn't have parables. Think about that for a second. Jesus is all this teaching. How do you teach somebody something they don't know by something they do know? Parables. The kingdom of God is like. Ain't nobody here seen the kingdom of God yet. So here comes Jesus. How's he going to explain this thing that he's bringing, which is not what they want? All right? Kingdom of God is nice, but could you bring a kingdom here? Yeah. Right? So Jesus is like, what I'm doing is like, this thing I'm talking about, this thing I represent, it's like. And then he begins to tell a story that opens up another reality for them. There are no parables in John. John has metaphor, all right? John has metaphor. So, metaphor is a kind of speech that makes reference to one thing by using another. 
It has the same function as parable and that it gives us understanding of something else by using something familiar, but it does it in a different way. A metaphor literally takes a word from this universe and a world from this universe, things that don't normally go together, and bring them together. And when it does that, it creates a new field of meaning. So, some of you went um, on the trip to the Holy Lands, and one of the things that struck me um, is the landscape. There's a lot of dry and arid land, a lot of rocky and stepped terrain, and the Psalms say over and over and over again, the Lord is my rock. So when you're looking at a rocky terrain and a hillside and think about a storm that comes up suddenly, where are you going? You're going under a rock. That's, that is the shelter. It's the natural shelter. If you have to be protected from the sun, there may not be any trees, but there is a rock that the rock is the, the, the natural land formation that is your protection. So when the psalmist uses that image, the psalmist is taking something that is very well known to a community to say something about the nature of God. Okay? Take something tangible and change it. And when I use that metaphor, I don't look at rocks in the same way anymore. Yeah. All right? That's the beauty of a metaphor. One of my teachers said, when a metaphor is working, it should be vibrating. It's so tense trying to hold these two things together. So now I'm going to tell you about another metaphor that you're so used to hearing that you take it for granted. Jesus, in, his, in the Lord's Prayer, said to his disciples, this is how we're going to pray, our Father. We call God Father, and we don't even bat an eyelash. But when that concept was introduced, people were like, how do you call someone whose name is too holy to say Father? Think about what a radical concept it was and that some people would have considered it sacrilegious. Yeah. And we stand up here and pray, Father God, Father God, Father God. Like it's just very, very simple. It's a radical concept to call God Father. God is not us, but in that metaphor, we are saying something about the nature of God, that God makes God's self in Jesus, one of us, that we belong to God through adoption, that we are a part of God's family. We are not the same kind, all right? We and God, you know, we, all this stuff about, you know, me and God, we cool. No, we're not. All right? We say that kind of stuff, but God is not like us. All right? God's holiness means God is never going to be like us. And that, that we get to be family with God is a remarkable concept. So when you say the Lord's Prayer and you say our Father, every now and then you should just pause and take a breath. Because it is a privilege to say that. And if, oh, let me go one more thing. You're nodding now. You're not going to like what I'm going to say next. If God as Father is a metaphor, that means that there are other words we can use to describe our relationship with God. Hear me. We don't want to be idolatrous. Calling God Father doesn't make God a man. Calling God Father doesn't make God a man. God does not have a, God is not limited to gender. Just because we're limited to gender, don't put that on God. That's not God's problem. That's our problem. That's our being. That's what it means to be human. But God is larger than that. Which means, which means that there could be a place where you could also call God Mother. I'm overwhelmed by the amens. <laughs> Woo, it was so much. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Woo, I got my one. 
So metaphors have attention and they push our understanding of reality. But just let me circle back around for one second because that little bit of ant that you felt when I said God is mother, that's how you should feel when you say God is father. That's exactly what the metaphor is supposed to do is unsettle you a little bit. All right? So, okay. Metaphors have attention. They push our understanding of reality and they have the potential to transform the way we see and think and understand. So a lot of uh, churches talk about language about God. And some people um, want to say we should only call God Father. Other people say I'm tired of calling God Father. The tr we don't, we're not trying to fight for one metaphor. The whole point of metaphors is to have more than one. And you know that because you learned that in the Old Testament with all the names for God, right? So if we only call God God Healer, then God stops being I am what I am, right? Because sometimes God is healer and sometimes God is provider. Sometimes God is, so it's the same concept. Whatever the metaphor is, we never want to find ourselves fighting over one. Because in that moment, you've limited God's potential to act and move in your life. All right? All right. So, so metaphors that we see in John are going to transform the way we see, think, and understand. Now, if we're used to saying God is Father, we're going to be used to all the metaphors that you've seen in the, in the Gospel of John because we are Baptist and we read the Bible, right? So one of the things I want to do is say a little bit more about metaphor, and then we're going to just try to unpack what it would have been like for people to hear Jesus use these I am statements. Fair enough? Are we good? Okay, I've got a little bit more to say about metaphors. So metaphors are the way, so I talked about how we explain the unknowable. How do we take on new information? We use what we know. We talked about parables as the kingdom of God is like. Metaphors help us to think about the incarnation differently. And then we get these I am statements in the Gospel of John, which play off of God's divine name. If God's divine name is I am that I am. Every time Jesus makes an I am statement, he is evoking or invoking God's personal name or that reference to God's personal name. Do you all see that? Nod if you, yes, okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So think about what happens when that eh yeah, asher eh yeah, when that I am becomes flesh. All right, when this essence of God, which is ever before us and beyond us, becomes flesh, what does it look like? And I think the gospel writer of John is trying to get to that through the word, through language in these I am statements. Okay, y'all ready? Yay, we're ready. All right, so there are seven I am statements, and we're going to look at five. And the, can you see those two in the middle in the dark type? Okay. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus describes himself as the gate and the good shepherd and the resurrection and the life and the way, the truth, and the life and the vine. We're going to look at the ones in the white type. The other two are going to be your assignments. Before we go on, I want to be, um, just have you make note of the fact who is naming Jesus? Jesus is naming himself. All right? So in a lot of the other stories, it is someone who calls God after having an experience with God. Jesus is God in flesh. Jesus comes as fully human and fully God and makes these claims about himself. And that's part of the reason he gets into trouble. So let's look at John chapter 6. We're going to look at John chapter 6. Okay. 
John chapter 6 is um, a chapter that's got several units in it. And one of the things you want to do when you're studying the Bible is look at what you have. So in John chapter 6, the first thing we have in verses 1 through 15 is what? Feeding of the 5,000. On the scale of miracles, this is pretty high up there. All right, so we start off with a big thing. Feeding of the 5,000, followed by yet another major miracle, or sign as John would call them. Jesus walks on the water. Okay? So Jesus does these two amazing things, and then he speaks. And we get this piece about the bread from heaven. So let's look in verse 22. The next day the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. That's making reference to feeding the 5,000. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Why did Jesus say they were looking for him? Because they were hungry. Now we chuckle a little bit. But what were the political and socioeconomic circumstances of the people who were following Jesus in Galilee? They, right, I mean, we would probably call them food insecure, right? That they had food, but maybe not always enough or not when they wanted it. So maybe that's not a bad reason to follow Jesus, right? Jesus says in 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that the, the God the Father has set the, the seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So they said, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This indeed is the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. I'm going to stop there. When I read this, and I read it slowly, it seems to me that Jesus and the people are not communicating well. And part of the reason they're not communicating well is because Jesus is talking about something they've never heard about before. Here's what they know. They know they ate the other day, that they ate well, that Jesus made it happen, and it was this remarkable sign. And they're like, whoever this brother is, we are with him. Then they're following him, and he says, the only reason you're following me is because of, well, okay, yeah, maybe the only reason I'm following you is because I fed you, but oh, you fed us. But then he starts talking about this eternal bread. Now I'm really intrigued, except he's not talking about what they may be thinking about. Stay with me here. This is one of those passages where you hear it all the time, Jesus is the bread of life, Jesus is the bread of life, that you miss the difficulty of this exchange. Their experience with Jesus 
on the mountain where he fed the 5,000 reminds them of God feeding God's people in the wilderness. It's a great story. We're in the wilderness, we don't have what we need, and God makes bread come down from heaven. Fast forward, here we are under Roman oppression, and we're in another wilderness, and we don't have enough to eat, and Jesus comes and gives us bread. We will follow you, just like our ancestors followed Moses, except that's not the scenario that they're going to get, right? They're still trying to figure out how to make the, what do we have to do? What do we have to say to get more bread? <laughs> you know, do the works. What works do we have to do? Just tell us what to do. And Jesus is talking about something that has nothing to do with their physical needs at a time when that's probably the most pressing thing on their mind. All right? Do you know what it is like when you are really, really hungry and you come to a church function and the person who's supposed to bless the food gets up and starts preaching instead of blessing the food? <laughs> Do you know how annoying that is, right? You're like, you're thinking all these things like they didn't ask you to preach. They asked you to bless the food. And then, right, so then they got to do their little piece. And then guess what? Somebody gets up to sing a solo. Like all of these things keeping you, you are not paying attention to what's happening. You're trying to get. So part of the problem with this person who is fully human and fully God is that sometimes we're relating to him as a human being and he flips on us and becomes divine and starts talking about bread from heaven. He, oh, okay, whatever, right? But, but the, so Jesus is calling us out of our humanity when we're feeling our... Do you all know, have you ever had this experience in your life? When you come to God with this tremendous and pressing need and God's answer is nothing about what you want at that moment and it's about transforming you into somebody else, that the answer is not in the immediate need. The answer is in the encounter with God. And this is the tension in that moment is the tension of a metaphor. All right? I am the bread of life. You'll never hunger again. Well, I don't know about that, because I'm pretty hungry right now. What is Jesus talking about when he's talking? So he's using the word hunger, but he's not talking about this. But this is all they know, right? Well, maybe not. Maybe they do know what spiritual hunger is like, but they're not thinking about their spiritual hunger, right? Right? I am the bread. How do you sell a message about this? I said, what is the hardest part about this chapter is selling a message to people who are hungry. That we can deal with Jesus walking on the water. We can deal with Jesus feeding the 5,000. But the real challenge is Jesus talking about being this eternal bread that we can't quite get our hands on, all right? Jesus is telling the people in these, these words, you think I am here to feed you when in fact I am here to fix you, okay? That's what Jesus is doing in John 6, okay? All right, let's go to the next one. I am the light of the world. This is in John 8, 12. Okay, first part, oh, this is a good one. John 8 begins with the story of the woman caught in adultery. Okay, you remember this one. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So the other thing about being in the Holy Land is you understand stoning so much better. There are rocks. No, seriously, there are rocks everywhere, right? There are rocks and pits and rocks and pits. And so what do you do? You throw rocks at people in pits. That makes sense. That's what you have. Um, David and Goliath makes sense, right? Um, even when you hear about um, 
people in conflict throwing stones. Yeah. It all makes sense. So you've got this woman caught in adultery, and mm, we don't know what Jesus wrote in the ground. Okay? But whatever it was, they walk away. Jesus asks the woman, um, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go your way and do not sin anymore. And then Jesus spoke and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisee said to him, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. So Jesus again is like, I am. And they said, no, you can't do that. That breaks the rules. Um, and, he, and they do. Jesus said, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I have come from and where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Okay, so again, here's the problem with Jesus is that Jesus comes in and says, I am the light of the world. The Pharisees are the religious officials. That would be us. And we would show up and say, that's not allowed according to our church covenant. No one can stand up and just say that. And Jesus says, well, you can't because those are human standards. But after all, I'm God. So I can say I am the light of the world. What do you, how do you respond to that? What do you say? Think about how we say this all the time. Jesus, light of the world. But think about how provocative, how profound it was. Light is the first thing God creates. Wow. Right? So now go back to John 1. In the beginning, wow. right? In the beginning, when God creates the heaven and the earth, God says, let there be light. John, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was with God. Light in creation, light in the temple the candle operas in the temple, all symbolizing the presence of God, all right? We use light as a sign of the presence of God, and we have this truth claim then around Jesus as light. This is the antithesis of darkness, and light in creation is the first sign of order. Jesus does not say, I am bringing the light. Jesus doesn't say, I am like a light. I am. The scandal of the gospel is the claim that Jesus makes that he is the Son of God. And just because you've heard it over and over and over again doesn't make it any less scandalous. Wow. That somebody stands up and makes this claim. They are either a lunatic or, or, or you know, something like that, or it's true. But it is risky. And that's what this metaphor is holding together. Okay? Can I keep going? All right, let's look at the next one. Yes, let's look at the next one. In John chapter 10, very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheephold by the gate, but climbs in by another way as a thief and a bandit, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The sheep, the thief, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Oh, that's where that verse is. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So we've got two images here that would have been fairly well known in the ancient world. First, I want to talk about gates, two kinds of gates. A lot of ancient cities that would be fortified were walled with gates, all right? 
The reason you have a walled city is for security and protection. All right? And so if you look at ancient cities, as some of you did just a few weeks ago, you have the walled part of the city, and then you have the people who live outside the walls. So if enemies ever come, you get inside before they close the gate, right? Because, no, this is important because this is how and the, who has access to the gate, who, who grants access. This could be the matter between life and death. The second image would be for animals. Animals fenced in enter through a gate. Jesus says, I am the point of entry. All right? That this is the gate that keeps some things out and keeps other things in. Jesus is saying, I'm the dividing line. All right? Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of... um, Okay, so here's, okay, here's the challenge. Before Jesus showed up and said, I am the gate, how did people, un- how did people think they were going to get to God? Sacrifice, keeping the law. Like, there's a whole religion that exists that explains how you get to God, right? This is like people had been following a religion Jesus shows up on some random Tuesday and says, now it's me. (laughs) Understand, again, how these statements destabilize the existing religion. Okay? If you are serious about your relationship with God, every now and then, God is going to destabilize everything you know by making a claim on your life that says, are you going to do it my way or not? Am I God or not? Am I the light? Am I the gate? Am I the bread or not? And that decision will destabilize you in a sense because it's going to cause you to have to step away from everything you thought you knew about who God was, right? So think about what happens when Jesus says, I am the gate. What I love about this I am statement is what comes right after it is that I am not just the shepherd, the good shepherd, because there can be bad shepherds, but the good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. So in that image, Jesus is not only saying I am the way in, but that I am invested in you. I will lay down my life for you. All right? So now that, that kind of, for me, that mitigates the destabilizing part, all right? God is asking, Jesus is asking us to let go of what we know, but the person who is asking us to let go of what we know and the person that we hold on to when we let go of what we know is worth everything, all right? That's, that helps with that first part, Okay? Jesus' claims destabilize the religious tradition because Jesus' claim to divinity is a threat to religion, to that religion, okay? And I'm going to say a little bit more since we're talking about destabilizing and say sometimes we worship our religion instead of worshiping God. And when we find ourselves in that place, God will show up in ways that will trouble us, okay? Okay, John 15. All right, this is the best ever, John 15. Okay, Um, let me read a little bit of this. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. When I was growing up, it said my father is the husbandman. Um, He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word I have spoken to you. I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We're going to come back to that verse. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be full. Okay, first question I'm going to ask. In the overall narrative in the Gospel of John, when does Jesus say these words? Flip through your Bible. What happens before? What happens after? Hmm. John chapter 13, what's happening? I heard somebody whisper it. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And when would that be happening? Okay. Chapter 14, I mean, chapter 13, he tells about his betrayal, he tells about Peter's denial. John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He also promises them in 14 the, the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 15, he talks about being the vine. 16, he talks about the Holy Spirit. 17, he prays for his disciples. 18, he is betrayed. In John's gospel, Jesus is giving all of this teaching right before what? Right, before he's betrayed, before he's crucified. I am the vine. You are the branches. He says over and over again, abide in me and I in you. Your purpose is to bear fruit. This is an extended metaphor, all right? It's not like I am the light, I am the bread. This is this lovely drawn up. I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. Who's, or the vine dresser. Who's doing all of this work over it? It's God. And that's important that he says, my father is the vine dresser, because throughout the prophetic text, we have references in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel to Israel as a vine. All right? So in the Old Testament, God says to God's people, you are my vine. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I'm the vine, y'all are the branches. All right? So that you are connected to me. Your lifeblood, your sap, all that you need, your nourishment is coming from me. And you will not survive if you are cut off from me. It's very simple, but profound, right? So you've got to stay connected. You've got to stay connected and be fruitful. It's not just enough to stay connected. Some of us got to get pruned back so that we can bear fruit. But the purpose of the pruning is to be more fruitful, to be more productive. God wants us to be vital, productive, alive, bearing fruit. This is what God wants for us. So in this long series of teachings that Jesus is giving before his crucifixion, he's not just being descriptive, he's being instructive. Because there's going to come a day when the disciples are going to be sitting around looking at each other. What do we do? What do we do now? Go bear fruit. Be fruitful. Make disciples. There's certain things that you, can, that you should know to do when you don't know what to do. 
Like there are times in our, I'll, I'll speak for myself, there are times in my life of faith when I'm like, God, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Except there are some things that you can know that you should do. Like it's never wrong to pray, right? It's never, I mean, God will put things in front of us to do. And one of the things that Jesus is saying to his disciples before he leaves them is, abide in me. The metaphor is powerful. Living it out, what does abiding in God look like? What does it look like for me to remain connected to the vine today? Okay? What does it look like for me to be fruitful today? How do I live out this command? All right? It's a, it's a powerful and central metaphor. Um, for those of you who like to memorize Scripture, this is a good passage to memorize. It's a good passage to memorize. Abide in me and I in you. Right? And think about the ways in which we limit God's ability to abide in us because of all the stuff we fill ourselves up with, right? So I, I was telling some folks, I had a, um, we had a silent retreat at the seminary yesterday, so we weren't supposed to speak from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. Girl, I know. We weren't supposed to work. We were supposed to be, we could pray, we could read, you know, could walk, but the idea is to quiet yourself. And I... I am not, I'm not a person who cries easily, is what I want to say. I could, it was hard for me not to cry for the better part of the day. Because I think we get so busy that when we finally slow down and allow some room for God to get in, right, it can be overwhelming, right? So this, how does God abide in me? So I want to stop there so that we can think about going forward what it means to abide in this vine, what it means to have this vine abide in us. And now for our homework. There are seven I am statements, but the two that I didn't use are the ones that um, are not only well known, but engender a lot of theological debate. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Seven I am statements. And I'm making the claim that all seven of these statements are metaphors. Okay, so how are these two passages, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, how are those metaphors? Because we tend not to read them that way. So that is your assignment, and Pastor Wesley's going to have to give you an answer. Fair enough? It's fair as far as I'm concerned. All right. Um, any questions? We've got about two minutes if there are any questions. I'm going to take that as a no. Um, let's um, prepare to leave this place and pray before we go, all right? So for next week, read these two passages and think about them and how we read those as metaphor, okay? Um, and I'm going to ask for your um, understanding. Um, as soon as this, is, um, this Bible study is over, I need to have a meeting with the ministers for um, just five minutes, so I'm going to ask that you not... Um, ask them anything so I can just have a few minutes with them. But if you need to see them, they'll be back after about five minutes. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. All right. God, we are so grateful for Jesus. 
and the statements Jesus made about who he is and what that means for how you operate in our lives today. Continue to reveal yourself to us, Lord. Make yourself known to us through these statements. Transform us, God, by the tension in these metaphors so that we begin to understand all that it means that you sent Jesus in human form so that we could be reconciled unto you. Make us ever grateful of your gift of love. We pray, Lord, for this church, for every member. We pray, God, for our pastor. We pray, God, for all those who lead, all those who serve as leaders. And we pray, God, for all those tonight who are in need, in need of shelter, of food, comfort, and help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, saints, we'll see you next week.